Um, if you'll remember, I'm Greg Coleman. I'm the president of the association. Tonight, we're going to talk about safety. We have Gary Hansen Jr. Um, his company is our a consultant with us, American Safety and Health. Um, they are experts on all kinds of safety issues and health, and they're most, uh, most important to our industry. Any employer you have or you will have, I guarantee you that safety will be a big thing in that company. I've seen a lot of guys get fired for working unsafe because employers can't take the chance on somebody having an accident and costing them millions of dollars. Their workers' cost insurance, their insurance for their vehicles are two of the biggest costs they have. And if you have bad safety practices, you're going to make their rates go up and they're going to say, have a nice day, go to Walmart. And so listen, pay attention. It's very important. You'll need it. Um, we also had another guy walk in with dog. I think they were in a parking lot together. <laughs> this is Bob Krulik. He's with Ohio Concrete. He's a Northeast Ohio promotion director. Um, he's going out there knocking on the uh, architects and engineers' doors, um, getting concrete instead of asphalt, specking job sites. So the next time you're on a job and you're doing a parking lot, think of Bob and thank him because he probably was involved in, in getting that, that, that parking lot into asphalt or into concrete from asphalt. So with that, we'll turn it over to Gary. Thank you guys very much, as I said. Uh, I've been in the industry and in safety here. Uh, started in the 01, 02, and uh, first thing I did in the industry was jump out right into the concrete uh, world. And prior to that, I, I wasn't heavily familiar, but I've been up and through and in and out of more concrete plants than you guys can imagine. I've seen all the dumb things, all the smart things, the old, old plants, some of the newer, more modern plants. I've heard the horror stories of uh, what can happen when you don't do all of the right safe things. And we're going to get into occurrences when I talk about all the right things. Uh, it's one of those uh, situations where you really you can screw up a thousand times and nothing can happen, but you screw up one time and everything can happen. It's, uh, it's really just can turn into disaster very quickly. So you don't want to make mistakes when it comes to big heavy things. <clears throat> but uh, first thing I did in the industry is I came out and uh, I was uh, able to do a combination of things. I did a lot of work with training. I did a lot of drum cleanup procedures. I'd go in and write the drum cleanup procedures and train the guys on it. And of course, I'm not inside the one, so I'm you know, training them on how to do it. And as the joke was, it's Wednesday, that's your final, it's the chip on the truck. But it's, it's not, so you can still show up. <laughs> you know? uh, and the other thing I did was I got to do a lot of respirator fit testing. Does anybody here know what respirator fit testing is? Okay. Anybody in here been in the military? Okay. When I was in the military, I came out in 95. I was, uh, uh, they did a video of our uh, basic training group, uh, the Sullivan family, the profit and stuff like that. I had two highlights on this video. Uh, one of them was they had a, they had a hand -hand combat, a tournament after we did a league and stuff like that, final executive tournament. And they had two divisions, big guys and little guys, and two won it. I won little guys. And I knocked the dude out unconscious less than three seconds in the final. So I, I tell everybody that, but that was 139 pounds, and I would lose the big guys today. So uh, the other thing I did, a little less glorious, I actually thought I'm brilliant, I'm smart, I'm great, I'm a good swimmer since I was a little kid. So three years old, I could swim, okay? Swim underwater all the time, back and forth, back and forth, that lifeguard certification, whole nine yards. So, I'm going to be able to beat this. We get into the uh, area where they're putting us in the gas chamber and they're hitting the urine gas, and I'm sitting there and I'm pretending everything. I'm holding my breath. I can hold my breath for three minutes. So we get to the point where I'm walking out the door. I got this licked. I must have looked substantially different than everyone else coming to the door because it didn't take but a split second. You weren't the captain's you. sitting there at the door and he has the big thing, the door's open, and the big wooden knob. Gate or lock, basically, like old medieval style, you know, put the boards down. So he's got this whole system up there, and then he pulls the door shut and he locks it. And private, you think you're the first person I've ever seen pull this trick? Takes his, 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 uh, his helmet off and just smashes me right in the gut. Boom, tell him he broke my ribs. And of course, at that point in time, he says, Back to the line. And I come out of this, and that's the other part I get to show in this video is coming out. Puke all over myself, it's not down in my shoes. It was, full-on disaster. I, I got the worst of it by far by trying to get the best of it. So uh, I uh, used to do the irritant, I bring this up because I used to do the irritant smoke and the bitter stuff and the nasty stuff and I've seen some pretty big guys drop when they tell me that not shaving the, uh, the 
you know, is not going to affect their seal on their respirator, and then you find out it really does. And they don't like it. But uh, I've switched over to the sweeter stuff. But uh, I tell everybody that, hey, I've been through worse, so you know what I mean, and handled it a whole lot better than some of these big concrete guys. But I'm sure you guys would be able to take a little bit of a bit drips or something like that. Cool. But that was the, that was my introdu introduction to safety was concrete. At the time, OSHA was out introducing themselves to several concrete companies, so they uh, they sort of called me to come and come out and do a lot of work. I've been around it for a long time. It was actually uh, well, a really neat the way the industry works. If you know the ins and outs and the whole nine yards of it, so uh, hopefully, if you guys can realize safety is a huge part of it, it's a good job to have. Modern economy, there's not just a thousand different good jobs just hanging off trees right now so as you said you know what i mean it's one of the things you don't want to screw up so why do we have a safety program that's a little introduction for me and stuff like that but why should companies have safety programs i have here just a little bit of fun to start it out we have the what's called the safety at work competition award winner i've got on some more of these but these here are more comical ones uh nothing graphic in here so i don't need to warn anybody about turning their stomach because it's, these are all the funny ones not the disgusting one. First of all, you do have four posts in your industry. We have the get it done. From what I've heard about this line, I can't vouch that everything's true. The plant manager comes in and tells the supervisor of the section, I want that tank up on the shelf, and you can't really go home until it's done. So he got creative. Creativity is not always a good thing. I'm a big think outside the box kind of guy in general in life. If you can get something done productive. Safety, not so much. This is not one of those scenarios. Forklift on top of forklift. Here we have the operator of this fork truck because he wouldn't sit inside of it. He refused. He says, oh, no, 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 I want to do a jump. Right. So he's in between the mast and the fork truck, the extra counterweight, the tank up top, and the safety guy is spotting on the bottom. He has to catch anything Whoa. that falls off, including the fork truck. The fork truck falls, he's jogging to catch it. So, so what is it? Uh, who knows? There's no safe part of that job. There, you know, it's all it's all bad. <clears throat> Here we have the yeah front end loader. I mean, this you can tell the teeth. This is a good bucket. I mean, it'll it'll tear some ground up. You, know, you guys hear all all the carpet trucks companies have front end loaders. You know what I'm talking about. The teeth do wear over time, but this is a good one. They're up there, aluminum ladder, and he's very hooking the guy's leg. The way he's actually attaching, you got to be close friends for this. <laughs> and hopefully no one have burritos or tacos for lunch. But he's bear hugging the guy's leg like this while the guy's doing all the other stuff, reaching around, pulling all the wires up. So if you're to fall, only half of you is making the ground, the other half is going to water from the bucket. Oh my god. I wasn't gonna go there. Here we have the United States Navy at its finest. <laughs> I was Army Intelligence, one of my kids, I know it's not an oxymoron, Army Intelligence, uh -huh. Army Intelligence, Army Intelligence, Army Intelligence, I heard them all. But this here is one of the, uh, if you remember back to Bunker Buster bombs, they were shooting like one, two, three levels boom for the original uh, Iraq war back in like 91, 92. That's basically what we have there. It'll make a, a lot of area disappear and blow the whole circuit time. But uh, here's the hard hat, so you know the guy sitting up there, here's his foot, he went off the side. Here's where he landed. So it was real. Uh, probably just wasn't a chalked uh, truck that he drove onto is what I'm predicting. Uh, I think that he probably pushed the truck out and then came down. So Here we have, this is called management. <laughs> okay. Supervision, whatever you want to call it. Uh, you know, I've been told there's a chance this could have a little Photoshop going on, but it's still a fun picture. You know what I mean? It's probably a family outing or a golf course or something. But here we have all the hazmat full on people with the supply there and everything. So, yeah. They're not looking at it, so I don't, yeah, it's just another fun picture. This one here is just ludicrous. It's, uh, it's awful. This could be a disaster. Bare feet, pool, aluminum ladder, power extension cord, tool tools, full nine yards. If you have three things going on, which one is a ladder, two is a person, three is a power tool, it's almost a guaranteed disaster. You throw water and aluminum ladder involved, then uh, I, I, this can't be. No, I, this is this. Is not, you can tell the guy's soaking wet up to about under his armpits. Yeah. 
This is not Photoshop. And the guy back here, this is really high end. This is all like nice, you know, bottles of alcohol, you know, beers and stuff. So this is a swim up bar. So this is a fairly nice resort or hotel, wherever this is located. He's on the wrong side of the ladder, too. Yeah. Yeah. It might be a double ladder. I'm not. I'm not going to sit there and, and say that he is definitely on the wrong side. The rest of it's so bad. Okay. Listen. I'm from West Virginia. I was born there. These are my people. I'm sure of this because nobody else would come up with this, but my my personal relatives. This is some. Bill Bill the engineer, whatever you want to call it. But it's, it's, it's hysterical because it's a wooden made ladder all the way up top and there's a guy holding it like it's going to do any good. I was on But how else are you going to fix the lights? Got to do what you got to do. You know what I mean? Uh, I was told, I haven't seen it, but I was told there is an actual video. If I mean, I would pay money for it of this truck driving down the road. So whoever took this also had a video camera and actually took the video. I have not seen the video. I've looked for it. Somebody said, yeah, I think I saw a video of that driving down the road. So maybe he was wrong, but that's all I got. So there's some of the fun stuff. Uh, and the pictures we saw there, you know, no injuries, and, you know, no, nothing grotesque or gory. Uh, I, I could show you those pictures for an entire session of reasons why not to do things, but we're going to take this a little different direction. The reasons companies have safety program is primarily, we would hope, it's the moral correct thing to do. Okay? I, I've only seen <laughs> All my years, I, I just might have changed. I'm not going to give it a tell the company is not in the concrete world, but I've only seen maybe one company where the owner really doesn't care about his employees, and it's still shocking to me because he seems like a nice guy outside of that, but he hates his employees, doesn't care what they breathe in, and uh, it's uh, it's nothing to do with concrete, so it's not something that's not around here. So, but uh, it's uh, every every other company I've seen, most people are good people, a vast vast majority of people with good people. Even owners of companies are good people. You know what I mean? And they don't want their employees to get sick, get injured, get hurt, get killed. And more for just reasons than just their workers' comp, which will run you down for workers' comp is a disaster. We'll talk a little bit about that here coming up. But for more reasons just workers' comp, you know what I mean? Most people just don't want other people to get hurt. It's, just, it's not a natural human thing to do. And I believe at this point in our society, Hopefully we just don't have, you know, evil, greedy owners out there running the Pinkertons up on the, the union workers and shooting them anymore. I think we're a little bit past that point of our, our time. So, no company can survive without hardworking, dedicated, loyal employees. It's very rare that you see companies today, big companies, large, profitable companies that don't have some form of safety program. It's very rare because when you see the big companies, large companies, if they don't have a safety program, they're getting killed in common. Okay? And it's just one of the things. It's hard to keep employees, good, loyal employees, to build your company, to train the next generation, if they're all getting injured off over time. So don't stay in business long. Yeah, you're not going to stay in business long. Again, it's one of those things. It's like most companies uh, I do see that don't have great safety programs are due to... Uh, not intentional, I would say it's unintentional, they may not be aware of everything. They believe that everyone will do the safe, right things and no one will get hurt. Uh, meanwhile, reality unfortunately does typically catch up with these uh, sound companies. Unless it's a crash company. A what? Crash company. Well, you know, if they deal with they get so much work to blow the work out, they don't care what happens, but they don't change the company next to their daughters and sisters. Yeah, I mean, those typically, like I said, the big long-term successful companies, that's typically not what happens. But, you know, hopefully we don't run into those. And I don't think in the uh, industry we're in here we're going to run into too many of those type of companies. Hopefully not. So, but employees give their life energy every day to help companies do three things, be successful, grow, and make a profit. Okay? You can't hate a company for making money because they're not going to do business and do what they do if they're losing money. It's just a formula of success. If they're not growing, they're shrinking. If they're long term over time, if they shrink, they're going to shrink into nothing. They're going to lose employees, lose contracts, things of that nature. Uh, we do have, I do see this happening to where uh, owners stick around long enough. They're getting older. They're not paying as much attention to the business. Then things occasionally go. You said about, you said about a company getting smaller. What about this uh, lean, lean thing? You ever heard of that? Yeah. That's a real killer. 
Yeah, I mean, that's a high productivity scenario where some young college, you know, really believes in that. Um, I'm not going to get involved in the lean, but it uh, it is. Unfortunate. It's a real loser, let me tell you. Yeah, for the, for the people, it's a loser. It's definitely. It's, but we're going to talk more about the concrete industry where it is still required. We still do need people out there. We need truck drivers, match men, and people you know, who run the plants, things of that nature. So I don't really know how that would affect this industry. Why would they come over there and hope they work two trucks at once? They got the one leak that they can figure out the two be a trunk. <laughs> don't give me any ideas. <laughs> Driving from dispatch. Then at that point, I mean, he's a chemical inspector. He's one of the best. Uh, good companies understand and appreciate the value of their employees. And again, the other reason that we're going to run into safety, and unfortunately, it's uh, what we're going to talk most about here, is the legal requirements in OSHA. How many people here in OSHA? I know, okay, and here's the other thing. How many people have ever heard of uh, DOT? Okay, same thing, right? Say same thing? Nah, quite exactly the same thing. I will tell you one uh, funny little uh, story I heard back in about 0203. A lot of my prior concrete companies was on a night four big bridge. Uh, and they come out there and, of course, you know, big job occasionally get some, some eyes out there looking at it. <laughs> uh, concrete driver gets out of the truck. And I don't remember if he had a yellow vest on or if he had a red vest on. But he gets out of the truck and he puts his hat and his vest on everything. You know, he's, he's ready to go. DOT comes up and gives him a citation for the wrong color vest. <coughs> According to the DOT specs, he had to have the green style vest that we had a red. And then he goes inside the truck, we call up and he gets the right stuff, all the time he gets, he gets a good one. Comes up, OSHA shows up and writes him a citation for having the, the green instead of the red vest on. I'm not sure. I, I've heard about this being a reason. I was told that this really, really did happen. I was not there. But uh, that's all, all uh, good to go. We don't have that issue anymore. And the other scenario that I've seen to where DOT and OSHA work together on, and uh, I don't know if it's going to affect you guys so much, but it's uh, chalking of wheels and like the forklifts. If the forklift goes in and the wheels are not chalked, OSHA, and there's an injury accident, something goes on, OSHA is going to hitch the forklift end of it. If the wheels aren't chalked, the DOT can actually potentially get the other side. There's no winners. Everyone gets cited. So if you see a situation where you're going to take a fork truck onto the, you know, into a tank, container, flat, something, you know, your job, either way, wheels have to be chalked. Everyone gets cited. There are, there's no way out. It's not their fault, it's not our fault. Because they you going to be. The one should do it and the other should verify. Thank you, Pardon me? <laughs> no, concrete trucks are a little different, but I mean, like, occasionally, you guys, some of you here make it to the point where you're operating for close at your location, picking supplies up and off and stuff like that. So at that point in time, if you're going onto a vehicle, wheels have to be charged. But they make the new dock locks and stuff. So. It has to be something that's going to be more convenient than getting out putting, getting out putting shots in the wheel because you're moving. You can take us in off the truck, you got to get up in the air, move it, and you got to put it somewhere else. You can't get off the truck. You got to look at the wheels one way or another. There's no whip ends or butts around it. We're not going to go over forklift transportation today. Yeah, I'm not talking about a trailer. Yeah. Uh, like if you're coming in through like a dock, the dock plate, the, the system, and the ramp. The cargo freight. Yeah. But as far as OSHA goes, there are 55,000 OSHA regulations. Anybody here read them all? I read most of them. Here, I read most of them twice. I'm sure there might be one of them out there I might have missed. I got the book at home. I read two pages and fell asleep. I told everybody, I tell this story to everybody. I go, I've written plenty of hazard mitigation programs for different companies. I said, if you have insomnia, I do have the cure. The National Sleep Study of America, Sleep Foundation, they should come to me. If you can read my entire HASCOM program from start to finish at 3 a.m. and not be snoring before you're done, then there's no cure for you. You know what I mean? But it's uh, just what it is. However, uh, also OSHA has, uh, they have three big things OSHA does. One is they try to come out and come up with new rules, regulations. Uh, they try to work with people and government and, and do some, some positive things. And then they carry the stick of enforcement. So 
Uh, as far as enforcement goes, they can find you if the companies aren't doing the correct thing. Now, it's rare, but it does happen that OSHA will come in and find a company to the point to where they're no longer going to stay in business. Uh, it's becoming more and more uh, common currently, but it's uh, still not a uh, very, they, it's not, they don't want to put the companies out of business. There are severe violators, and, and those companies typically have done several things over periods of time that are, that are very wrong. So it's not like everyone jumps on that list, but it seems to be there. They're starting to push that, that scenario in its first, you know, safety reasons and things of that nature. And citations for willfuls, and this is where the company actually did something they knew they were going on. They still ordered a, an employee to do it or to, to move a guard or to work around some rotating part that they knew was the safe. They can get a willful. Willfuls are 70,000 as the top level. However, I'm sure everyone here reads all the different federal posts that are coming around early November, right? where they came out and they are raising the rates. They said these are all 1990 laws and uh, serious ones. This is a standardized fine. Now there's a reason that they're going to, they typically drop these. We're not going to spend all day on, on fines. But a $7,000 fine, okay, they show up at a concrete company, you have a guard off of a machine, you're running it, there's no one sitting there actually trying to get their hands in there to move something. That would, ex you know, make it a little worse, but they find something without a guard on your running productively, boom, they hit you with a citation. You don't have MSDS sheets for your chemicals, boom, there's, you know, very easy citation. So they have their things they can do, they, you know, they, they can find. I mean, you can spend all day telling them what they are, but what just go with, they find something. The max they're going to hit you for, for a vast, vast array of what the different possible citations, it's going to be 7,000. Then they're going to say, okay, you have a good history, you haven't really had a lot of problems, we'll deduct that by half, you know what I mean? Uh, you're a smaller company, you're, you're not a huge, you're not, you know, Firestone, but I have supplies, you not get quite the same love some of these, the smaller guys would get, just due to the size of the company, they would expect more. Uh, due to that size. Well, you might get reduced again. I think you're going to negotiate it out and work out some kind of a compliance deal where you sign an informal agreement with the area director for a promotion and think you're going to have to do whatever it says. And whatever they put in this informal agreement, they're going to have to do maybe some more stuff. And then you may get even a larger reduction. Sometimes it's you promise safety this and that and the other thing and put 10 hour classes in and all kinds of stuff and they'll give you discounts so that way you have some money to do it. Hey, Ah, uh, no, not no. I want to. I've met several area directors, and I've met all the ones in Ohio, at least back in the day. And most of the new ones, uh, they basically all been turned over. Uh, they're they're pretty straight shooters. Uh, if you get to that level in the government to be an area director for for an organization like OSHA, you're not going to be going under the table. Now, I'm not going to say that you might not find a different government, different agency, or compliance officer that been offered money, they have been taking it. I know uh, I was talking to a gentleman, a Russian electrician, who was on a job on the west side of Cleveland, and, and it was just, he's not public safety protocol. Very good electrician, not used to the safety standards here in America. And he wasn't joking, and I remember, like it was yesterday, I, I, I wish I could have been on video. He's like, ah, oh, safety guy shows up, ah, it's costing a thousand. You know what I mean? Because in Russia, that's the way it was. If government inspectors show up, you paid them a thousand dollars, they left. Here in America, he, he still thought that if OSHA showed up, that he was just going to pay the OSHA compliance guy a thousand bucks, and he got to walk off the site. Like, like he, he had a bit of belief that that was a real thing. I'm like, I don't think that I mean, that was definitely on the <laughs> He's on some pretty visible sites, so he may eventually get introduced. Um, so. Here we talk about more OSHA. The penalties have increased significantly over the past five years. And again, the, the two that we just saw earlier, like this here might go up to 124,000 and change. This here can go up approximately eight, 78 to 80%. They have a cost of living and uh, production and all kinds of things that they put into a program and they said that uh, the values should go up 80%. Now they still put off the discounts, but they're gonna start potentially at a higher level and that goes into effect August the first. So the other reason they do it, and here's what we're talking about, is injuries cost money. It's not all workers' comp. Let me ask you guys here, see if we can figure it out. Okay, now we know the state of Ohio has a, its own comp system, and to be honest with you, for the most part, it's pretty good. It's, it's better than some of the other ones. And they can offer you discounts and all kinds of great stuff if you do all the good stuff and keep your injuries low and 
all that kind of stuff, you can save some money. They used to have it to where if you set up a drug-free workplace program and a couple other safety programs, you can save even more money. It was really pretty exciting, and uh, I did that a whole bunch of it for several years. However, there are other costs. We're talking about interest. Anybody have an idea what they would be? Downtime. Bingo. Anything else? Basically, downtime incorporates all the different things, but that is a very good answer. Training. Replace. Training of a new employee. You know what I mean? To get a good worker at your shop, your concrete company, your facility, whatever it may be, is not a simple thing anymore. It's not like that there's a hundred guys lined up outside your door who will all live, eat, die for your company and do all the right things and won't do drugs and won't be unsafe. You know what I mean? It's not like that. Unfortunately, as he was saying, that he had some very good employees in uh, his past job where he had to let some go due to uh, what visually looks from the outside is a silly thing. And we're going to talk a little bit about here some of the drugs that are affecting us, but just compensation of one is direct cost and indirect cost. Okay, direct cost is this. I have a worker, falls off a ladder, breaks his leg. He's out for 12 weeks. We have to pay that worker on the bank. Now the state's going to pay him, but you're not paying a direct check to the worker at this point in time. They're going to back figure your rate and they're going to add this all into it. But in the end, you're going to pay it. Trust me. That's just yeah, yeah. So, okay, so they're going to figure all this good stuff out, and they're going to say, okay, this is how it works. You know, we're paying your worker, and he get, you know, should get all the rehab, all the medical, all the different, you know, doctors and things that he should have. And sometimes it's 12 weeks out, and then he's on light duty on top of that. And now, not only are you paying him, you have to pay another worker. But this worker is not 100% ready to go right now. You don't keep extra trained workers on your payroll, typically. You know what I mean? Now, you need to be able to rotate bank a little faster depending upon how that works out. But, but some of the other companies doesn't quite work like that. So now the new guy doesn't work out. You have training, you have productivity loss. You have jobs that aren't getting done as well as they should. So you have all different types of problems that go into the indirect cost and direct costs. Direct costs here are actual handling of the claim, medical, temporary, total disability, awards, the penalty rating, as we talked about, the rating of your comp. Your comp is based off of sick codes, the number of hours worked, all kinds of stuff like that. It's in the payroll. And they figure out this formula, and then you pay X percentage of this. Now, if you're penalty rated, you're paying maybe one and a half times, two times what your competitors are paying. You know what I mean? If you're credit rated, you're paying maybe half. So let's say that you have two companies side by side. Two big companies, you're a huge job. Do you think they have to figure payroll and top and all that into the bids? If it's a large enough job, do you think that if a company is paying 200% comp versus a company paying 50% comp, that company that's paying four times as much as the other would have the same chance that they bid it with those numbers of getting the job? They could just underbid your comp. And you can't get around it. I mean, the state's going to come get it. One more, I mean, it just is what it is. And if you bid too low, you could lose money on those jobs. So comp can actually do a tremendous amount of damage. It'll, it'll chase you down the middle of the night. Where you, you know, in uh, a four-year period of time in California, 50,000 companies that would otherwise be profitable went out of business strictly due to compensation rates going up. And I'm not saying these are good companies, bad companies, but I mean, some of them left the state, some of them went Somebody said, here, change the name to their brother-in-law's dog or whatever. You know, the company, and, you know, they may have done a few things like that, but there are companies that, for no other reason, but their workers' comp rates went out. Now, California has a little bit of uh, unique workers' comp rules and regulations and laws and penalties and awards. We're not going to get into that, but they're not like everyone else necessarily. So, they uh, can get, get $10,000 tickets in a truck. And, and not in Wakapo, but what DO, DO, DOT will in California, they give you a $10,000 ticket. Wow. And they go hire yeah. you. I say, where do you get a ticket like that? <clears throat> yeah, they give you $10,000 tickets. It's amazing. Uh, indirect costs can be substantially higher. We've talked about most of this here. Downtime to the production, supervisors required to do the action investigation, additional training costs for new employees, additional replacement wages. Uh, the benefits, everything goes into that. Uh, higher unemployment workers' comp rates, uh, unemployment rates, workers' comp rates, productivity slowdown, 
the brake employee, equipment damage, all kinds of stuff. And we could go on quality problems we talked about. You may have had a great worker get hurt who could do a job.